Um, so this week I'm, I'm pretty excited about what we're going to be doing in the lab section. We're going to be working with data from the sun and the techniques that we learn um, this week will be valid. Um, one of the project options and we can discuss this is going to be working with asteroids and detecting asteroids and meteors. Um, and we're not going to do that in the lab this week, but a lot of the techniques that you use in the lab would be similar to what you might do in that project if you guys choose to do that. So the module this week, uh, last week we were working with this NASA API wrapper, NASA, Earth, that sort of stuff. Now we're moving on, looking out the sun, and it's going to be a similar installation. Um, in the textbook, there's a couple different pieces of software that you need to install. If you get an error, um, it's probably because you didn't install the second one. But this, this is all also in the textbook. Um, but basically, this is how we're going to install SunPy, and then almost everything we do in the lab will be working with that. Um, and I'll give a bigger overview of some of the data later in the week, just like I did last week with the Landsat data, but just to give you some information already, the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly, AIA, images the solar atmosphere in multiple wavelengths, and that links changes in the surface to interior changes of the star, and this data includes images of the sun in 10 wavelengths every 10 seconds, so it's a lot of data, and I'll just show you a little video that I made using this data. This works. You can actually see this is our sun and you can see it moving. This is from um, January 2016. But in our lab today, we're going to be able to get images from yesterday, basically. So, <laughs> is the sun uh, Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> okay. But we're still learning some Python so that we can work with this data. Um, but again, all of this Python has a purpose. Um, so I'm going to teach you some concepts. We're going to work with those concepts in the lab and um, the labs will illustrate those concepts, but the end goal is that all the concepts that we're learning these first four weeks will be the basics that you could tackle any problem that you wanted. You'd learn along the way, but you wouldn't be kind of overwhelmed. You'd be able to say, oh, I want to work with this. Is there a Python module for that? Um, I want to do this in biology. Is there a Python module for that? I know how to install a Python module. I know a little bit about how you work with Python modules. And in the project, we're going to learn how to do it from scratch without me kind of guiding you through it. Um, but one of the advantages of working with a language like Python is that there's just so much available code out there already for you to work with in tutorials that getting started doing something really cool very quickly, um, once you have these basics, is easy. Um, or easier than it would be if you had to write this all from scratch. Um, and then as well, when you work with someone else's code, you can learn from their code. You can read, read through it and say, oh, they do it like this. If I want to do something similar, this is what I might do. So we've already met a lot of functions. Um, they help us generalize and reuse code. Uh, we've already used print, help, type, range. Um, you can kind of recognize them because they have a name and they have these parentheses and then sometimes some arguments. Um, then when we worked with the NASA data, we used the functions image and assets to get images or lists of assets and then access their images and later relied on the function that I defined for you and many of you modified um, to be even more advanced called fraction white pixels. Um, so what is a function actually? Um, we've already been using it. Um, it's a grouping of code that can depend on some parameters. Uh, the code can then be called, and you might hear invoked or evaluated um, with arguments. At the time the code is called, um, the parameters that uh, were in the function definition are set to be equal to the arguments, and then the function executes its code. 
So the general form here is DEF, D-E-F, stands for define, uh, the function name, parentheses, any parameters, and then a code block. So you define the function with DEF, you choose a name for it in the section function name, parameters are optional, there are a series of variable names we will use within the function. And then the code block of the function is also known as the body. Is that Nico? Uh, so do you replace uh, the word function or do you just replace uh, the name? That's a good question. And I'll, I'll update that, Nico, because you replace both function and name. So I'll, I'll make that one word to make that clearer. Uh, Yeah, um, I've found that when I do that, some students actually put in the greater and less than sign. So it's also, just like this confused you, the greater than and less than sign can also confuse some students. So um, you replace both function and name. Anything kind of in italics needs to be replaced, and those two are replaced. And in fact, I have the slides right here, so I can, I can update them in a second. I will do something like that, yes. Um, Here's an example of the function. Here you can see that I've replaced the whole name by a name called say something. Um, so the parameters I've chosen are what to say a number of times. And then when the, uh, what is the function name here? Momo? Say something. Um, and then what are the function parameters? Someone else? And then what about the code block? I have something from a girl. Mix things up. <laughs> what do you think is the code block, Sierra? Everything else. Sweet. Um, so then when say something is called with arguments, which is in the last line here, um, at that time, say something goes ahead and binds or connects what to say with the first argument, good morning, and number of times with the second argument, too. So it's almost like you don't see this up top, but it's almost like there's an equal sign. What to say equals good morning, number of times equals two, and then the function proceeds. Um, and uh, that just means that you're able to name any parameters and then without writing additional code, go ahead and use those parameters. And automatically when you call the function, um, all those arguments are set, um, the parameters are set to those arguments. Uh, that also means that we can call a function with variables and those variables can have totally different names to the parameters. So our parameters were what to say a number of times and here, I'm going to make a variable called statement, and I'm going to make a variable called number, and then I'm going to call say something statement comma number. So when statement, say something is called with the arguments statement and number, what to say is bound to the statement, so what to say is using variables now, and number of times is bound to eight. Um, so it's just like that assignment puzzle that we did in the notebook last week when you're assigning one variable to another what happens when you assign a parameter to an argument that happens to be a variable, what happens? Um, so this allows us to reuse the code and type just a line instead of an entire loop. And that also means that if you debug your function, if you know your function's working correctly, then um, you know you can use that wherever without making a typo or um, introducing another problem. Return is something that's special to functions only. Uh, it can only be used within a body of a function. If you use it elsewhere in Python, Python will say no. Um, any items following the return statement are the value of a function with, when it's evaluated. Um, and you can have more than one return in a function, but as soon as you reach one return, the function's over. And anything after the return is what it spits back to you. Um, so if a function returns a value, it's good practice to make sure that every single scenario, so you have an if statement with a bunch of elifs, you don't want five out of the six statements to return something and one of them to return nothing. That's going to be very confusing. Um, so if you have branching code or loops, 
You want to make sure that every scenario of your function, if you want it to return something, a return statement is reached. And we'll see an example of that here. Um, so here's a function uh, with name, full name, and parameters first name, last name, and it returns the first name, a space, and the last name. So printing the full name Harry Potter will print Harry space Potter um, because we have that return statement there. So you don't have to do the print within the function. Um, a lot of times we've done prints within the function, but here with Harry Potter we could do whatever we want with, with the value of that function after. We don't necessarily have to print it. We could set it to a variable and then add it to other um, uh, characters or completely change the name of characters in a novel uh, by using the function. Um, so here's an example of that. Uh, name is equal to full name, Ron Weasley, and then we can print the name later. We can use the name in an if statement. We can do a variety of different things. This is something that we'll work with more next week when we learn about object-oriented programming. Um, but there's a special type of function uh, called a method that are associated with certain objects. Um, so for now, you can think of methods as another sort of function. And the first argument is written before the function name instead of after, followed by a dot, a period, and then the function and the rest of the arguments. And it's basically a shortcut. There are some things in Python that we're going to learn about this week, tuples, lists, and dictionaries, that um, there's a lot of functions that work just with the dictionary, work just with a list. And instead of having to give that list as an argument all the time um, to those functions, you can just type the list and then a dot and then access the function. And a syntax, a method syntax. So that was a little short, the dot syntax, the, the method syntax, but we're going to see a bunch of examples as we go through and learn about lists and tuples and dictionaries. Um, variable scoping. So there's something in, in programming in general, not just in Python, called a namespace. And in a namespace, uh, the parameters in a function's definition, along with any variables created in a function's code block, are only valid within a function itself. So namespace is how long is a variable name that you create valid. Um, so if I say x equals 5, is that for all of Python for the rest of the universe? No, because when you close out Python and you open it again, we don't know what x is. Um, Likewise, if we make a function, and then inside the function we set x equals 5, and we don't return x, we don't do anything with x, after the function's done, um, printing x, trying to use x, we have no idea about it. Uh, the function has basically a, a narrow memory, and then it can remember anything with inside the, the code block of the function itself, but then as soon as the function's done, any of those things that, um, that it defined, it forgets about. Python forgets about. It's almost like it has amnesia. Um, so scope is the portion of code for which a variable name is valid. And that's known as the variable scope. A function scope is its code block. Um, so if you have outside of a function a bunch of variables, you can use those inside of a function. Inside of a function, if you create new variables, those aren't valid outside of the function. And we'll see more of this in, um, in exercises, but um, essentially, uh, functions themselves, anything defined within them, you probably aren't going to be able to use outside unless you use a return statement. Um, so the same variable names, you could, if you wanted to, use them again outside the function, reuse them. Um, but unless you set them to anything, even if they were set with inside the function, it's not going to matter. The names and variables assigned to them inside the function have no effect on the names of parameters or variables outside of the function. 
They live in two separate scopes. The inside scope includes the outside. The outside scope does not include the inside. Um, so variables outside of a function can be used within a function, but if you set them to any values within the function, those values pertain only within the scope of the function itself and Python will forget about it later. And we'll see some examples of this in our live coding section and in the lab. The best way to get a sense for this is to actually go and code it, because otherwise it's like a, a square, a rectangle is not a square, but a square is a rectangle. You know, it's easier to just see it as a gun. Uh, there are no pointers. Um, so the, the way to access the variables outside are to either return the variables or you have a variable defined outside the function that the function inside manages to change. Yeah, how do we change one outside? Um, so you can't set a variable name to a value within a function and have that be remembered, but you can change if you have a data structure like a list outside of a function, you can change individual elements of that list. And we'll see, I'll show that in, um, we're going to have some examples with mutability and how you can change individual items of tuples, but not the entire tuple itself. Um, so this, this section, probably a lot at once, um, is to give you a verbal introduction so that you've heard these terms before, but you're not going to be expected to know all of this stuff offhand uh, right in the lab. We're going to work with it and we're going to hear it again. We're going to see it in the live coding and we're going to see a lot of examples um, of it throughout the week and use it. Um, so even if it's coming a little quick now, um, you'll at least have heard it once and we're going to revisit it two or three times. Um, so data structures um, are a general programming concept and they're a way of organizing your objects and your code. Um, picking the right structure for the task will help you access your data um, in a way that helps you program quickly and in a very clear fashion. Uh, Python has a number of data structures that come with it, um, with the language, which help us along the way. Uh, tuple, a list, and dictionary objects are the most popular um, built-in data structures. In the algorithm section of the textbook, um, which is an optional section that I'm going to be giving lectures about, but we're not going to have labs on. Uh, we're going to learn more about data structures and how to design your own. Um, so the first one uh, is something that we already saw uh, last week when Nayeli asked um, a little bit about a tuple. Um, so a tuple is a series of items between parentheses, so the parentheses are important here, separated by commas. They don't need to be of a particular type or the same type. Um, they can contain va variables as long as those variables have already been assigned to a value. Uh, so some examples are 0, 1, 2 in parentheses, uh, 5, 2348.0, comma, hello in parentheses, or x comma y comma z, if previously in your code you've set what x equals, what y equals, what z equals. Uh, to get the number of items in a tuple, you can use the lang function. It stands for length. Um, and you can either have as an argument of the lang function the tuple itself, or a variable that has a tuple as a value. No, no. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So it also is the case with a list or or whatever. If I use a variable as part of a list, um, and then I later change that variable, um, it has no effect on on the list. The list basically creates a new copy of that variable. Um, it's a little bit more subtle, which we'll see in a second uh, when we deal with lists, about lists, tuples that have lists in them. 
if, for example, x is itself a list, and um, we're able to go into elements of x and change individual elements of that list, then you can change it. So there's a, a strange situation where um, you can change individual items of something, but not the entire thing at once. Um, so assigning tuples to variables, this can be a useful way of keeping track of multiple variables at once. Um, here, instead of x equals 5, y equals 7, z equals 19.5, those could be three-dimensional coordinates if you have a game or um, you have a plot. And here, uh, coordinates can be x, y, z, um, separated by commas, surrounded by the parentheses. And um, in this case, we can then access the components of a tuple by their index. And an index in Python is a number that starts with zero, which counts up to the part of the tuple we want to access. So uh, starting with zero is important. Some other languages start with one. I don't know of any languages with, which start with anything but zero or one. Um, in Python, you count from zero. Um, so coordinates zero is the first item, so that equals five. Coordinates one is the second item, that equals seven. Coordinates two is the third item, that equals 19.5. And coordinates three produces an error, because there's no fourth item. Um, so this is something that will take a little bit of getting used to, counting from zero. In, in Python, um, but we'll get there. Uh, slicing, we can do with both tuples and later with lists, as well as the index accessing. And it's a way to access more than one item of a tuple at once, um, using a technique called slicing. So here, uh, coordinates 0, colon 2 is equal to 5, comma 7. So the first number specifies the index of the start of the slice, the, the zeroth element, and the second index is the index of the end of the slice plus one. Um, so basically, the first one is, uh, it's going to return items that are greater than or equal to uh, the zeroth index at that position, but less than the second index. Um, so we're going to go 5 to 7 for that. And again, um, that's something easy to miss, but it's something that we'll get used to. And um, the best way to remember it is that the first index, it's kind of greater than or equal to, and the second index, it's less than. Um, so we already saw that we can assign um, a variable to a tuple. Um, so we can also, uh, once we have a tuple, which is coordinates, we can assign individual variables to that tuple. Um, and it's an easy way to kind of assign a lot of variables at once. Um, as long as there are an equal number of variables on the left-hand side as values on the right-hand side. So coordinates has three items, and here we have three variables, x, comma, y, comma, z. Um, if we tried to set w, comma, x, comma, y, comma, z, that's four things, equals coordinates, which only has three things, we would get an error. Yeah, what about three? Pardon? What about three? So three things works. So you can do x, comma, y, comma, z right, equals three. Two things does not work. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's, a, that's a good point. It's, it has to be exactly the same type. So equal number of variables on the left side and right side. So I didn't give an example of the second error, but that, too, would also be an error. Um, values which you can't change are called immutable. Mutable means changeable, and immutable means unchangeable. Um, this concept helps you write better code, because if you don't want something to change, you can try to write code to ensure that. Uh, and a tuple is one way of doing this. Once a tuple is created, you can't change the value of individual items. Uh, coordinates 0 equals 10 produces an error. You can't change the first item coordinates. It's always going to be the same coordinates. You can access the individual items. You just can't change them. And I introduced methods before. Um, 
And tuples have two methods, two functions you can call with this dot notation, which I promised I would give some examples of. Um, count and index can be used with any tuple. Um, so here we have coordinates, which is a tuple. Uh, count returns the number of items equals, equal to the argument of count. So coordinates dot count five um, is going to return the number of items in coordinates that are equal to five. So that count would be one, because there's only one thing equal to five. Um, index, the index method returns the first index of the argument of index in the tuple. So coordinates.index 19.5 is going to look for 19.5, and it is the third item in the tuple, which is index 2. Um, and so if I did coordinates in brackets, coordinates.index 19.5, this would be 2. Then I would have coordinates in brackets 2, which would give me back 19.5. And this is the first index of the argument. So if there's a bunch of 19.5s afterwards, it's just going to return the index of the first 19.5. Um, but count will return how many 19.5s there are. And again, you can think of this syntax almost as if count is a function taking as arguments coordinates comma 5 um, and then counting the number of uh, elements in coordinates that equal to 5. Um, but this dot notation basically lets us um, define methods that only work with tuples. If you try to do this dot on anything that um, doesn't support these methods, then it won't let you. So it's a way of Python um, grouping different functions that only work with certain types of objects. And we'll again learn more about that next week in the object-oriented programming session. Um, now we get to meet lists, and good news, they're a lot like tuples. They have two differences. One, they use brackets, these square brackets here, instead of the, uh, the parentheses. Um, and they are mutable, you can change them. Uh, some examples of lists are just like our tuples, uh, 0, 1, 2, 5, 2348 comma, hello, uh, or x comma y comma z if you set x y z elsewhere in your code. And to be honest, I, th I think lists, um, you'll see lists a lot more often than tuples. You'll see them both, which is why I'm introducing them both, and you will use them both. Um, but you can basically do everything with a list that you can with a tuple. It just has this ability to change. Um, you can add, access lists by index, just like you did with tuples. Uh, unlike tuples, you can also assign elements of the list to new values. Um, so we have coordinates with 4, 9, and 2. This time we can say coordinates 0 equals 7. Then when we print coordinates, it's now 7, 9, 2. List. Um, what would be the good places to use tuples instead of lists? Um, one good place is in a function argument. Um, say you want a function um, to have a default argument, um, and you don't want that to change ever. Um, so that would be a one, one good place to have a tuple. Another great place is if you're going to have, a, we're going to meet objects called dictionaries yet. And dictionaries basically will let you assign something that doesn't change um, to a value. And so we need something that doesn't change. Um, so you can have dictionary keys that are lists, um, but it sometimes is uh, more representative whenever you have something that's not going not gonna to change. Um, it's essentially a way of preventing people if you want to make sure no one does coordinate zero equals seven can prevent that by making a tuple. Um, the other common place to use tuples is in that uh, assignment notation where we have x comma y comma z equals coordinates. Um, that's a, a common notation. Um, but back to lists. Um, so you can also extend a list by another list with the plus equals operator. 
And lang is a function that also works with a list as an argument um, and gives you the length of the argument. In all our examples, we've had a coordinates um, uh, tuple or coordinates list. Here, if coordinates is a list or if it's a tuple, lang coordinates will be three. Uh, lists have the same method we had with tuples, count and index. Um, but because they're immutable, we can change them as well with a variety of additional methods that only work with lists and don't work with uh, tuples. And again, you can access those with that dot notation. And if you're in the IPython console, you can type um, any list and then dot and tab. And when you go tab, it'll tell you all the different methods that you have available to you. And that's also an, an easy way, instead of having to look things up, of figuring out what you can do. Um, so with a list, we have things like append, extend, insert, pop, remove, reverse, and sort. Um, and we'll learn how to work with these along the way. Um, some of them you can kind of guess what they might do. Uh, for example, sort, uh, maybe extend or append or insert. Um, some things uh, are a little bit more difficult to guess what they might do, but we'll learn how to work with these along the way. And again, uh, with any object in Python, if it has any methods that work just with those types of objects, if you have a variable or an instance of that object, you can in IPython type it in a dot and tab to see those. So, um, I don't know, have you guys ever heard of a turducken? It's a duck within a turkey that they serve. <laughs> like instead of t stuffing a turkey with stuffing, they stuff a turkey with a duck. Anyway, uh, kind of like that. Uh, you can stuff uh, lists into other lists. You can stuff tuples into lists. You can stuff uh, lists into tuples. You can stuff tuples into tuples. You can stuff tuples into tuples into tuples. Lists into tuples into lists. Uh, it goes on and on and on. You basically can do uh, whatever you like with these things. Uh, once you create your, your stuffing, here I have three lists within a list. You can access the elements of a list within a list by number as well. Uh, and the important thing to um, help you figure this out here is to just go in order. Um, so mentally, we have two... 2D, which is two-dimensional, 2D, two, is going to give us five comma six. Then we can even forget that we had 2D, two. Now we just have five comma six. Five comma six, zero, is going to give us the first element, which is going to be five. Um, so just kind of think of things in order. You could even have um, one of these items be a list, one of them be a tuple, and one of them be just a number. Uh, the important thing there is that then um, not all of those are you going to be able to call this uh, zero in brackets on. Um, so Python gives you a lot of freedom to structure your lists and your tuples however you want, but especially if you have different lengths of lists within lists, um, you might need to be very careful when you go to access something that you don't go beyond the end of the length or try to get the length of something that isn't even a list or a tuple. Oh, yes, this is, this should be, that's a typo. This should be 2D2. It should be as in the example there. Thank you, Nico. Um, so one very useful thing with uh, lists, um, you can do this with tuples as well, is that you can iterate over them. Um, you can create a variable name, um, then you say in, and then have a list or a variable that's equal to a list, and then use that variable. And every time in the loop, just as we were doing loops before, um, the variable that you define is set to the next element in the list. And we saw this already when we were using, we were using for loops last week. We just never made the sequences ourselves. We used range or we used something else to give us the sequence. But what range is basically doing is returning a list. And then we were working with that list. Here we can make our own list. Now we know how to make, build our own sequences. Um, so you can also iterate over a list of tuples or a list of lists. Um, in this case, uh, since 
each element in the list has three items. Um, we can make three variables, pet, name, and age, and iterate over uh, that list. And each time, pet, name, and age is set to be equal to the next tuple. So first it's going to be equal to cat, fluffy, and two. So pet will be cat, name will be fluffy, age will be two. So when we print, it'll be cat, fluffy, two. Next time in the loop, it'll be set equal to the next tuple, dog, Fido, five. It'll print dog, Fido, five. And then finally, it'll reach the end, uh, turtle, Leonardo, one, and print turtle, Leonardo, one. Um, so it's a very uh, powerful way that you can work with lists without having to worry about indices or what's the end of it or anything like that. Python handles all that for you. You need the for and you need the in. Um, so, the last uh, object that's the data structure that we're going to meet today and this week, um, so don't get overwhelmed, lists and tuples are very similar, and then we have this new thing called a dictionary. And a dictionary allows us to organize information in the forms of keys and values. We've already met tuples, which use the parentheses, and lists, which use the brackets, and now we are using braces for dictionaries. And it's lucky that there aren't even more of these things because otherwise we would have more objects to worry about in Python. So if there were more braces, different types of braces, they'd probably make a different object for each of them. Um, so inside your braces, um, there's a key followed by a colon and the value corresponding to the key. Between each key, colon, value, pair is a comma to separate them. Um, anywhere within the braces, white space is not important. Once you start the braces, uh, you can type lots of spaces, tabs, whatever you like until the end of the brace. Um, keys must be unique within a dictionary. So if we had more than one Sierra in the class, if we had, we were using first names as keys, we would not be able to use Sierra um, as a key. We'd have to use a longer uh, more complicated thing, because otherwise when you set um, uh, Sierra equals to something, it would, one student would overwrite the information of another student. And so here's an example. Uh, we could use a dictionary for an actual dictionary, which is probably where it got its name, um, looking up the definition of words. In this example, the keys are the words, cat, dog, pony, and horse, and the values are their definitions. Now, these are not the official Webster definitions. Um, these are just definitions I made up. Um, so for cat, we have, we have our English dictionary. We're going to set it equal to a brace. That's how you know it's a dictionary. Then our key is a cat, colon. The value definition is an animal with a, with a fur purse. That doesn't even make sense. Uh, an animal with fur that purse. <laughs> um, and then comma. And then you can have another key value pair. And then your last one doesn't need a comma after that. Um, so you separate the items just like in a list by commas, only in this, this case, instead of just being one thing, it's a key and a value. Uh, that's um, so that, that's a good question. So certainly, um, in this example, none of the things are a variable. You can make the keys and values variables. So that's not, not allowed. With, um, with a dictionary, um, you can't index it directly by the values. Because um, the values aren't guaranteed um, to be unique. We could also have a tiger that was defined as an animal with a fur purse or whatever. Um, so by the definition of keys, the keys have to be unique, but the values, we could have a lot of things which had the, the definition of a big pony. We could say a donkey is a big pony, et cetera. And so if we tried to access it by a big pony, it wouldn't know what to return. That said, that said um, if you wanted to do that, you could create code to do that. Um, you could, for example, uh, in the next slide, I'm going to show some methods that we can use to access a list of all the values. 
And then you could try to get um, the items in that list which are equal to what you, what you want. So you could write additional code to do that. Um, another option um, is you can have a dictionary within a dictionary. Um, so uh, you could also create two dictionaries, one that went keys to values, um, names of things to definitions, and another that went definitions to names. And then uh, if you had more than one definition that was the same uh, different names, uh, the same definition that was different names, you can make a list. Um, so there's a variety of different ways. Uh, basically, in Python, you can always do what it is you want to do, but if it's difficult, there might be a reason why it's difficult. Um, and the, yeah, you would need to make another function. And the reason why is that um, the way that Python does this internally is by organizing information like this, it's very quick to look up. Um, it's not that you have to read every page of the dictionary before you get to cat, and then finally you get to cat, and then you're like, oh, I finally got it. There's basically an index, just like in a dictionary where you can turn to the right page, and you get there immediately. Um, and that's one advantage of using a dictionary. Um, imagine we had a, a list of all the Facebook users. If I were to try to get to someone who had a certain username, and I had to read through the whole list, one by one. Even if, even if I'm a computer, there are billions of Facebook users, that would be really annoying. So we organize something so that it's indexed really well, then I could just jump to that person and be like, this is their profile. Um, so we can use dictionaries for many other tasks. You could organize information about students in a course. The keys could be their names, as long as those names are unique and the values could be a tuple of their phone number and an email. Then, um, basically, anytime you want to look up certain information quickly and have a good, unique key to look it up by, uh, email, phone number, username are all examples of that, a dictionary might be a good choice. Um, dictionary methods are used very frequently. Uh, to be honest, I don't use the list uh, methods that, or I don't use the tuple methods that often. Sometimes I use the list methods, but dictionary methods I use all the time. Um, so has key tells us if the dictionary has the key supplied as an argument. Um, keys gives us the keys of a dictionary as a list, which is especially useful for iterating over them. Um, note that the keys can come in any order, and the order isn't guaranteed by Python to be the same from call to call. Um, you can call lang on the list of keys as an argument um, to get the size of a dictionary. Um, values, the values method gives us the values of the dictionary as a list. In the previous example, that would be the definitions as a list. Keys would be the names of the animals as a list. Items gives us the keys and values paired as a list of tuples. So again, that would help you iterate over them. Um, dictionaries have a variety of other methods, but these are the most commonly used. If you're curious about the other methods already, you can go in IPython, create a dictionary, do a dot tab, and try some of them out. So as I mentioned, um, you can iterate over a dictionary, and the following two for loops print the exact same thing. So we could do for animal, comma, definition in English dictionary dot items, using the items method of a dictionary, um, which will return a list of tuples that are keys, comma, values. So then it'll go and set animal definition to cat, comma, an animal with a fur purse. Um, and then you can print those. Um, you could also uh, just use a tuple here. Since, each, since everything in items, everything in the list is a tuple, um, you could, instead of giving the variables names already, you could access the tuple by indices. So how you do this is up to you. Um, and um, this is two different ways of doing that. OK. Um, so we just have a few minutes left. Um, so in the next um, lecture, uh, we'll work with other things, but those are the main data structures, and already 
just with what you learned last week, if you master the data structures, list, tuple, and dictionary, um, you will be a basic programmer um, in Python. I know many of you are basic programmers or advanced programmers in other languages, but coupled with what you learned last week with lists, dictionaries, and tuples, um, you have the basics of Python. In fact, Coursera, which is an online course learning platform, has a uh, Learn Python course, and their first course, uh, after today, we've already covered all of their first course. So we're going very fast here. This is a college course for you guys. Um, so again, um, we're going to go through and practice a lot, um, because just like a college course, there's a lot of hours we're investing outside of class to learn the material. And most of those hours are in labs here at Caltech, where you're getting paid, which is great. Um, so let me show you a little bit about this week's notebook, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, let's see. Um, so this week we're going to work with um, first with the atmospheric imaging assembly data. Um, the great thing about NASA or the bad thing about NASA is that there's acronyms for everything. Mm -hmm. They have everything, all their instruments always have really long names and then some acronym that's associated with them. You don't have to memorize all these acronyms. It's not like in Python. Um, it's just so that I don't have to, I don't think they mean for anyone to type atmospheric imaging assembling, uh, assembly all the time. Um, so we'll be able to work with that data right away. What's up? There are some silly names, but yeah, you're right. The names can be very silly. Um, so uh, we'll be able to view some of those images. Then we're going to work with functions. Um, we're going to work with some um, constants available from the SumPy module, including an astronomical unit, the average distance between the sun and earth, and the solar radius. We're going to learn how to convert uh, those to something that is a little bit more easy to imagine, like miles, um, and uh, also light years if you want. Um, and we'll write functions to do that. Um, so you'll make a function definition here. And then uh, once you define your function, you'll be able to comment out this. And um, then it'll print the value of uh, the radius of the sun in kilometers, print it in miles, print it in light, uh, print the distance to the sun on average in light years, and then print the distance to the sun on average in miles. Um, then uh, we're going to work with variable scoping. Um, so here, in this example, there's a variable called color that I use everywhere. I use it as a parameter name. I use it as a parameter in a function within a function. I, I use it here, I assign it to different things, and I have a bunch of print lines to illustrate what the value is equal to. And right now, what this is going to return is a sun that's in uh, grayscale. And uh, what we want is the sun to be uh, purple. Um, so finally, when you kind of look at this code and examine it, um, you'll be able to change it so that uh, you have a really beautiful uh, sun in a purple color scheme. Uh, for the tuples and lists section, we're going to work with the Virtual Solar Observatory, again, that has an acronym, the VSO. Um, and it's a tool for investigating the physics of the sun. Um, so users, which are us, can search existing databases for Earth-based and space-based observations. And um, this kind of hides the information of where this data came from. We're able to just use it to search across multiple different data sources and events to find data sets of interest and download those. Um, and the one that we're going to uh, work with does have an extreme in it. And again, it has another acronym, <laughs> the Extreme Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope. Um, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, SOHO's Extreme Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope, uh, performed nearly 14 years of observations of the low corona of the sun from 1996 through 2010. And um, in the first couple examples so far, we've worked with local data. And this data will fetch it from a server. And we're going to deal with tuples here. So these are tuples. Um, and 
Uh, part of the, the purpose of this function, or this exercise, is to work with um, lists of tuples and tuples of lists. Oops, I'll click back on my notebook. Um, and uh, here, uh, we have a start time and a stop time. So the first time you run the code, you'll just run it and read it. Um, it's going to print images from one hour on September 20th in 2011, but we're going to write a function that lets us, uh, kind of like how last week we were writing functions to access uh, three-month chunks of the satellite images, here we're going to write a function that gives us a start and a stop time uh, once every month for a whole year, called year in review. Uh, so I don't know if you've ever seen on Facebook or another platform, sometimes at the end of your year, it says, here's your year in review, here's a bunch of photos from your year. So we're going to do that, but for the sun. This is what happened over a year. And you'll take, the only argument of your function is going to be that year. You could say 2010, uh, you could say 2012. Um, whatever you like, and then once you give it that year, then it'll actually plot um, the values for that. Um, so the main part of this function, uh, this, this exercise is just creating that function, which um, in the end will return a list of lists of tuples. Because <laughs> uh, every snapshot, every month, needs a start time and a stop time, which can be a list. Within that list, both the start time and the stop time are tuples, and then you need one for every month, so you have a list of those lists of tuples. Um, so this exercise is all about understanding how to embed those. And the good news is that there's some complicate, more complicated code here, um, but you're basically, once you create the function and test the function, you'll be able to just iterate over start and stop times and just put all this code within a loop and it'll display um, the sun's year in review. Um, the last section, a uh, couple sections, we're going to work with um, NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, we can access a variety of information about sunspots, radio flux, and geomagnetic activity on the sun. And um, in this exercise, we'll retrieve current solar cycle data from NOAA and uh, plot it versus time so that we can see trends. We're basically going to be able um, to uh, access a variety of information from NOAA. Um, and um, in the last two sections, we haven't learned about those, so I'm not going to talk about those. Um, but those are the things we're going to focus on for today. They illustrate lists, dictionaries, tuples, um, and scoping, all the things that we heard about today. Um, so we'll take a, uh, I'll first pause for questions. Are there any questions about um, the overview of the material that we're going to work with in lab today?